today we're going to talk to Sonia Mehra Chavla, who's a uh, well-known Indian artist. And her practice is, uh, is interdisciplinary practice. Uh, she works, she calls herself a researcher, artist, and, uh, uh, and she works across with many other practitioners, with scientists, with other artists, uh, with other people, with communities. So it is a very contemporary based idea of looking at ecological and nature issues. A lot of her work has been looking at landscapes of various sorts, which she then locates in the Anthropocene. I've seen her work on the southern coast uh, of India, on the mangrove forests, in the sea creeks there. But also more, more recently, she spent a lot of time in Scotland, looking at multiple ways of looking at little tiny creatures, if I may use the word, uh, which has somehow caught her fascination. She's had a number of very important shows all over the world, but currently she has uh, been showing a lot in Scotland, and she'll tell us more about it, and has a very important show coming up in Berlin next month, actually, in September 2021. And today we'll be exploring uh, her ideas and why, what drives her to do this kind of work, to work across disciplines, but also to look at the world as she does. So Sonia, it is a great pleasure to have you here. And as we had discussed before this call, it's an unstructured call to really understand uh, your impulses. But I'd also send you some images which you are free to respond to or not respond to. And so we just start with what you want to start with. Great. Um, thank you so much, Ravi. It's always a pleasure to be in conversation with you. And uh, it's a great honor to be invited to be part of your project, Samtal Zameen, Samtal Zameer. Um, and as I mentioned to you before, both very, very important words always, and especially in today's context, so Zameen and Zameer together, uh, you know, it has this great significance. So I'm going to start uh, by sharing a screen. I have uh, made a small presentation. And I'd like to start by really responding to two of the images out of the lot of images that you send me. And uh, I'm hoping this will be an open and really interesting dialogue. Uh, and I also want to learn a little bit more, uh, you know, about these particular images as well. So I think let's go ahead. I will share my screen. So um, my first image, I think this is from your, your series called Extinct. And a very, very pioneering uh, work of yours, I think, from a certain period, which was relevant then. It is extremely relevant now. And I think it is always going to be extremely relevant. And so one hasn't seen this project in real life, but I have seen a lot of this work in various forms, images, uh, you know, texts, in publications, through interviews and other kinds of things. So I'm aware of this body of work. But really, I think one of my wishes is to actually have seen this work uh, in both the public sites where it was displayed, but also maybe in the museum site. So I'm going to start with this image. These two images, in fact, very compelling images for so many reasons. And so I have made some notes and then I'm going to go forward from these notes and observations to share some other insights, being an artist as well as a mother later on with you as well. So um, essentially, we know that extinct refers to the catastrophic decline of vultures across India and uh, Indian, India's vultures have been, South Asia's vultures actually have been driven to the brink of extinction in a matter of decades. And uh, so when biologist Vibhu Prakash, he set, set out in the late 1990s to Coledo uh, to update his vulture counts, counts, he found the birds had practically disappeared. So in your work, I see that there's, this, uh, there's also a mycological reference. Here, I think of maybe invoking the image of Garuda uh, as the anthropomorphic messenger of the gods. Uh, where he, is, he could be shown in either zoomorphic or an anthropomorphic form. But again, uh, looking at other cultures, ancient cultures, like for instance in Egypt, the vulture was revered and associated with the mother goddess. And in India also, the Parsi corpses were left for consumption by vultures as a way to release into the or their afterlives. Uh, and so for me, uh, there are a couple of openings that I find in this work and it uh, lends for a very interesting discussion. For one thing, this opens and brings to focus the case of the human industrial cycle ravaging and irreversibly destroying or driving an entire species to the brink of extinction. And here it's 
potentially highlighting the destructive potential of human progress, this word that we like to use so often. And here I'm also talking about the case of diclofenac poisoning in the vultures, for instance. Then uh, the second point that it opens up is the notion of the institution or a museum as a site, which is then preserving the idea of nature in a concret concretized urban landscape. So this for me, the way I look at it, this is potentially a simultaneous take on Western science and its various historical controversies, whether you relate that to colonialisms or extractivisms or exploitation white and white supremacy responsible for ecological degradation, but also the very notions and methodologies for knowledge creation within such institutions. For example, in this particular project, the case of taxidermy, which was considered um, a science and part of a knowledge base that characterized a certain imperial imagination. Uh, the other point that comes into play is the artist's idea of a museum, in this case, a museum intervention, to effectively shatter certain ideological beliefs inherent in the fabrication of the way that an institution selects, exhibits, displays, arranges, and presents material. Uh, and then again, the, the object itself, the museum object, the taxidermy vulture itself, which is it's ideally a sign or reference to a vulture, but strangely, it is the vulture the, or the remains of the vulture itself, the, the animal having been gutted uh, and all the intestines, etc., drawn out. And so the, the very aspect of taxidermy's inherent closeness to both corporeal life and the very negation of life itself. And so that itself becomes a symbol of extinction, which is also the title of your work. Now, going uh, forward from this, uh, there are certain things I've been thinking a lot about while looking at these images. Why is this significant and why should we care? And how do you confront such prejudices, right? So we have, uh, the, you know, cultures have viewed vultures in a variety of ways and, and they've been called various things from raw-necked, ungainly gowns to condemning them for sloth, filth and voraciousness. And Charles Darwin himself, uh, you know, has been quoted calling them disgusting birds that wallow in putridity, for instance. However, no bird can be traced to more remote antiquity. These connections spread across culture as distinctly different as Egypt, Greece, and the earliest form of Christianity. Now the social, cultural, political, historic, and symbolic meanings that people attribute to animal species, whether domestic or wild, essentially shape the way in which we perceive and treat that species. And so human-animal relationships differ significantly across these societies and among cultural contexts within societies. And in particular, I think what's really interesting is that local people's conception or ontologies of and relationships with wildlife can diverge considerably from those of conservationists and scientists. And this is a really, really, I think, an interesting point, and we can perhaps discuss this later. In retrospect, I was thinking about why do some animals strike a chord with humans? prompting them to donate millions towards their conservation, while others will draw little more than disgust. So there is no one absolute reason, but could it basically come down to the idea of relatability? Second, what prompts human aesthetic appreciation of animal species? Positive perceptions of animals based on the physical characteristics are also shown to more strongly influence decisions of conservation policy makers rather than only scientific criteria. And this, is, this has been shown through many studies. And then, of course, you have the notion of learned disgust. And I think here, this is a, this is a very valid point because disgust essentially is a learned emotion. The babies are not born with it. I can strongly say that as a mother. But it is transmitted socially, culturally, and even within families. Then the question to us becomes, as artists and activists, how do we confront these kind of both natural and aesthetic prejudices through our work? And how do we call attention to the neglect of so-called ugly animals or ugly critters? Now, being an aware mother, I have been uh, also working with my children on these various science projects that we keep doing. And so there are these couple of websites that we keep looking at. And for reference and, you know, in order to get images and so on and so forth. And this is what I find. And for me, this is extremely, it's been very, very disturbing. 13 of the ugliest animals on the planet. And you have the vulture right there. And what is the note that is given there? Up close, however, this bird isn't so photogenic. 
Its bald head is an adaptation for its lifestyle as a scavenger, uh, since a feathered head would become clotted with blood while the birds feed on large carrier. Next article. Feast your eyes on the ugliest animals in the world. For instance, again, the head is typical of scavenging birds. If it had feathers, they would become gummed up with blood and guts as it thrusts its head into the, the carrion. And at the same time, you know, I can visualize my child absolutely mortified looking at this and this, this website. And this is, this is BBC Earth, for instance. Again, another one. And this is earthrangers.com. And we've often, I mean, a lot of kids look at this and get pictures and, and, and inspiration from this website. Cringe, Simon's top cringe-worthy animals. You know, for instance, and then from my own notes, um, how people react to wildlife is in many cases particular to a place and developed and maintained by complex social, cultural and political issues with some species drawn into webs of human significances. Now, as scientists see it, a comparative consideration of what we find freakish or unsettling in other species offers a fresh perspective on how we extract large amounts of visual information from a millisecond's glance, and then we spin, atomize, and anthropomorphize that assessment into a re revealing saga of ourselves. So therefore, for instance, no one would find the star-nosed mole ugly if its star were iridescent blue, says one scientist. But the resemblance of the pinkish nose to human flesh then subverts our expectations and becomes a perverse violation of whatever values we have about what constitutes normal or healthy human skin. Similarly, conservation researchers argue that only by being aware of aesthetic prejudices can we set them aside when deciding which species cry out to be studied and saved. People are also keenly, even obsessively, vigilant for signs of ill health in others. That means that anything that looks seriously asymmetrical when it should be symmetrical, that looks rough and irregular when it should be smooth, that looks like there might be parasites on the skin or worms under the skin, jaundice or pallor, as Miller said, and he's a very popular scientist, anything mottled is considered unattractive. We distinguish between the signs of an acquired illness and those of an innate abnormality, splotches, blum bumps, a greasy verdigris skin means possible infectious illness, while asymmetrical, exaggerated, stunted, or incomplete features hint of a congenial problem. And so, size, intelligence, behavior, rarity, how closely an animal resembles the human form all play a part in a reaction to certain endangered creatures. The salamanders, for example, are a vital part of their ecosystem, just as worms are essential to soil health around streams and the lakes that they live in. This is just about everywhere. Yet maggots, salamanders, rats, and I'm coming to the next image very soon, and snakes, the main instinct they inspire in human is revulsion. And in terms of threat to mankind, another interesting point is disease and illness seem to be bigger than being attacked by an animal. And so this might explain why most of us don't find lions and bears repellent. They are covered with the same type of soft fur that coat cuddly toys for children, even if it might be better to avoid one in real life. And so therefore, animals we can easily anthropomorphize, tug on our heartstrings. When it comes to threatened species, we prioritize cute animals over ugly ones. The awareness of attractive and endangered animals is far higher than unattractiveness. Seriously, how many charity appeals, billboards or fundraising drives have you seen in aid of the purple pig-nosed frog? And this is the last question to be raised here. And uh, I think the question to you is that when, when you, uh, you know, worked on this project, first is how did this project come about? And the second thing, I think it was pioneering to have such a public art project and bring this kind of work to the focus of the public in that scale in that time. And the third question to you would be that you worked with the institution, you work with the Natural History Museum, you know, if, I, if I'm saying this correctly. And so what was your experience of working with the institution and what was their responses to your work or your intervention? Yeah, it's been a while actually that that work is almost 11, 10, 11 years old now. But thank you for these reflections uh, on the images and the questions you raise around them. 
And of course, I want to then discuss further your mission of reversing this aesthetic conundrum we are in of the given aesthetics of what we like and dislike and how we create a sense of something through these kinds of visualities and narratives. I was a bird watcher for a long part of my life, uh, as something I did as a hobby. And I have observed this uh, vulture, these photographs from in the Natural History Museum and the public's roundabout outside it mm-hmm. were all from my own images, uh, which were taken about 20 years before that project in the forest, in, uh, in the urban forest. And I used to spend hours watching these fantastic birds, which used to nest really high on the trees and yeah. care for the young. And uh, somehow when you see something up close, then you, you, you see their, well, if I may use the word, their uh, speciesness or humanness or something. Humanness I use with great uh, sort of a reservation because it's a, sep- it's a word which separates, creates dualities. But uh, these are really more than human and they have their own kind of order, social order, whether it's instinctive or otherwise in which they live. And you see the same amount of care which you, when you talk as a mother. And you then relate to that and you start loving these birds uh, yeah. as you would love many of the birds, as you would love anything or anybody when once you go beyond your first sort of impression of impression them. So because therefore the physical, you know, like... Physical. When you see something and it's deeper, thing, you, you will have a, get a better idea about it. So when the opportunity came, that was a time when, you know, my other work is on chemicals and completely other world researching on chemicals and toxicity. And I was very interested in how this crossover of an ancient animal has been done in 15 years when 99% of the South Asian population went extinct because of one painkiller called Dacrofranac. And the sky in Delhi used to be full of vultures when I was growing up. And now you don't see, you see mostly kites. Yeah, and uh, exactly. the vultures are very different because they, they fly at great heights and almost mm. become specks. And they have a particular wingspan in the way of flying. And at that time, I was interested in, just interested in the idea of the museum at a very instinctive level. Because uh, firstly, I was, interested, I was fascinated by the dioramas in them. I had visited the museum many times. And the diorama in them had these fantastically done uh, scenes and one of the photographs he showed is one from, from yeah. one scene of a kill. And somehow it is full of life and yet lifeless. And somehow uh, when we show these animals, we don't show the stories around these animals, mm. the politics mm. around these animals, the human world around these animals. Mm. And we show, the, show them as we show and see in many TV serials or TV programs, them living in relative uh, isolation when actually nothing is in isolation right now. So I wanted to both expand the museum outside mm-hmm. because, of course, the museum, museum unfortunately burned down in 2009. Yeah, yes, we are all sadly aware of that. Yes. So Just I wanted to expand out. the museum to the people. That was one disruptive thought. This second disruptive thought, next to Dioma, I spent a few months trying to find a breeding pair of vultures, which I then found from my network of friends in Rajasthan, and I filmed that breeding pair. So next to this diorama of these extinct vultures was this one breeding pair looking in the nest, which is a whole, a whole film of the breeding pair, which was showing on a screen, which looked like another kind of life. And also the idea of death really an extinction is a very complex idea because extinction, we always, as you said, look in one species wise, but it is never species wise. No species lives in isolation. When you take, exactly. out, a, when you take out a bird like this, a, well, there the are day. repercussions clearly repercussions, in the ecological system. Not only, not only, yeah, an ecological in its nature culture ways, you know, it is in the way in which people relate to that disappear. There are stories and uh, almost life imaginations and life forms which people build when, when they're living with trees full of vultures, which disappears. And of course, the, there's nobody. So you take out a whole web of things, which is too complex to understand at just as removing a species, you know? And so both the idea of death, which I thought I needed to remind people of, and the idea of the majesty of these birds from the yeah. carrions to the majesty. And as we, as we know from science that these are very caring birds. 
Yeah. These are not birds which are predators. If you don't like predators, those exactly. are, but they really eat the dead. <laughs> so they and they are the so scavengers of, of yeah, absolutely. And like in Parsi community, it's like a service in a way yeah. to a community, you know, like as well, but also to the larger ecosystem. Uh, because after after this scenario, of course, you have uh, you know the the dogs and and the rats and yeah. infestation of various kinds that sort of you know takes over when something is eliminated, something so important, even in the food chain is yeah. eliminated, for instance. And this is something that's also happening in the waters as well, you know, with certain bigger life forms becoming extinct, uh, and so those hierarchies are being replaced by others. And so that is also creating uh, this whole uh, kind of other kind of cycle, which has far reaching uh, consequences, so to say, right? Yeah. Right. And in nature, as you know, there are always things which are falling out of use and getting extinct because nature is changing all the time. It's when we intervene that we create an imbalance and then we take out a, a key, a, well, a keystone, which otherwise would have survive but so there's such a history of how many species we have removed from the planet by our mm -hmm. uh, intervention not because of mm, any kind of need but just we like don't like them or fear them or we just want to take them out but it opens up a whole question of both the uh, as, uh, you opened up a whole set of questions both about uh, aesthetics about colonial uh, narratives about western science uh, but about relationships as well and separations. So uh, these are all the questions which are important when we think about a multi-species world, even if it's a notional idea. Great. Thank you for that, Raveen. I think there is one more question to follow from there, which is also because I am, as you know, I'm also, you know, sort of working with so many institutions and we are both aware, you more than anybody else that, you know, like probably that institutions do have their own agendas as well. And so how was this, uh, how was your experience of this in intervention uh, within the museum and how did the people within the museum react to your work? Well, it's like any museum. Museums are precious places for, and rightly so for people who, who maintain them. But uh, fortunately, I knew the taxidermist there for mm. a long time. So that was a big help. Mm. And so long as we don't, didn't disturb the exhibits, they were fine. I didn't think they cared very much about, about what was happening. Uh, for them, it was a museum. Uh, I think it was also positive because, you know, at some place we were drawing more attention to the museum than that fantastic exactly. museum drew, you know, we, we sort of ignored that <laughs> wonderful handmade museum. We don't find such museums anymore. Uh, you know, exactly. they're not made anymore. These are all, all handmade things. But uh, there was already, already the tension in that building because the building is owned by a biz, big, uh, one of the biggest business associations in the country. And that museum was on hire to them. And they, there was already, already the dynamic that they wanted that museum space back. Mm, right. So, because so way it, back then already. Way back, it was not. They didn't because they, it's, it's in the center of the city, the prime estate. Exactly. And they wanted right. it back, and of course, they were not getting it back so easily. So uh, it's it's a very strange kind of dynamic, and to enter the museum, you have mm. to go through this business counter of this, mm. you know, business association, and then walk up to the museum. And so there was not much. I think the museum didn't have a lot of self pride. Mm. Or the citizens, except for, for every weekend, there's to be hordes of school children who were brought in by, the, by the school teachers to walk through the museum. But I, I, I don't think it was really utilized to the extent it could be as a place for learning and creating, creating new sensibilities. So it, it became really fossilized in, its, in, in a literal sense. Yeah, and then the tragic ending, of course. And the tragic uh, ending, and as you know, I've been subsequently working on natural history museums and especially looking at what they omit, you know, the, the idea of the, of the colonized museum, mm, and, mm. you know, the colonized nature of natural history. So I've been to such museums across the world now, photographing them as a visitor. Uh, and you see what they leave out. So that museum is very much on the kinds of museum you see everywhere else in the world, of course, older and not as grand and, you know, uh, but uh, on the same idea of isolating the human from 
preserving, conserving, and putting it out there for people can see it. It's okay because you at least see something you may not see otherwise, but it's not enough because you never tell the stories about stories around, yeah, you know, exactly. uh, the stories which, in which these things exist. And as we know, storytelling has become a very important part of, uh, of the way we look at ecology and, and nature now as. Yeah, as people. also a very important way of connecting yeah. uh, with our audiences as, as well. As people have, Anna Singh has started writing yeah. very so beautifully. So I think these are uh, new narratives being drawn up and also to escape this binary, we have to fill that binary with the relationship. Hmm. And now this is the second um, image. And of course, uh, we have resonances with the previous image and the project. But again, I think the question to you would be, is this a new series that you're working on? Is, it, is this a stand alone image? Because I don't have too much other information about this one image, but I'm very curious about it. So this is an image of uh, a, mou a mouse in a mouse trap, And there's a small video, which I've not exhibited, but the media of the mouse running around. It was very, uh, I found it interesting uh, when I was taking it because the mouse was obviously panicked out completely. Mm. Yeah, and, yes, of course. And there was great panic, great anxiety. And of course, we've treated mice as, as, as pests and pests is another category, but yeah. also as guinea pigs. So, you know, little guinea pigs and then mice and rats as guinea pigs as experimental disposable animals in a sense. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so uh, and you know, why I put this image was because when you look at the eye, the eye of the mouse, uh, yeah. it's almost like it speaks to you and it spoke to me mm -hmm. of, this, uh, of this life form, mm -hmm. in a sense. Yeah, so um, I was, when I looked at this image, I think the first thing that, it, that draws, the first emotion that draws me towards this uh, image and how I react to it is, is the word empathy. I think that's the very, very first thing. And I think this is, this is the word that is increasingly important and relevant. And I think this is something that going forward, we need to make sure that the children have abundant amounts of this because the world that we're leaving behind for them isn't a great one. And so very, very important decisions would have to be made and made very important changes would have to be made by the younger generation. And so I was thinking of the idea of myths versus facts, okay, and how do we counter certain biases? For instance, what, what would I tell, uh, you know, and how would I teach the younger generation even, you know, about such, uh, such creatures, for instance? What are our preconceived notions about, you know, rats, uh, mice? Rats are stupid rodents. On the contrary, rats are considered to be intelligent. They're also intelligently cautious. For instance, if a fellow rat dies after eating food, the dish will be avoided by other rats. Rats are carriers of diseases. And this, is, this, this has just been said and passed down through generations and then generations. And nobody even questions this st statement anymore. This statement resonates with the mistaken belief that rats were responsible for plague in the Middle Ages, which of course claimed millions of lives. And now with, with our virus and the COVID-19, again, there's this renewed interest in completely a complete sanitization. So again, these kind of questions have come up once again. Uh, however, it was always analyzed by the scientists um, that it has uh, that the black death was not spread by rodents, but by human fleas. Rats are callous. It is a fact that rats will not only have abstract intelligence, but also emotional intelligence. Rats would prefer to starve rather than accept food when another animal has to suffer. And so uh, they show compassion and they try to help out the other animal. Another one, rats are dirty animals. A close look at the cleaning behavior of the rat shows us that it's close to a cat in terms of cleanliness. The animals do not like to get dirty. If dirt gets into their fur, they immediately clean themselves. And also they love to clean each other, which again is, is, an, is a proof of their very social nature. One rat means 1,000 rats. And I've, I've heard my mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, they've all emphasized this time and again. This is more or less true because they are family animals and they, and they really bond well with their own families. They believe in group life. And so that group life kind of offers them security, uh, protection, so on and so forth. In the wild, rats live in groups of approximately 20 with a strict hierarchy. However, herds of 200 animals have also been 
No. However, if a right is a rat is cited, this does not automatically mean that a whole batch is following, uh, which is again another uh, another bias, uh, another reason for a bias. And so, uh, you know, these kind of questions that one has, uh, a, a, it's a matter of awareness. Let's just start with that. But it's also really, you know, the idea of getting people to notice, and only I think. By noticing, can we move forward? By paying attention, can we move forward? And so, you know, the constant question of even within my own practice, at this point, I'm confronted with these several queries, and then you know we'll come to that. But the question again of how does one, uh, you know, talk about an art science engagement in a way that is beneficial to the public? I think these kind of questions uh, are very important uh, for me now. You know, going forward. Right. And so, uh, with that, uh, uh, Ravi, your comments, uh, you know, on that before we move ahead. No, let's move to your work. We'll we'll discuss uh, as we go we'll, along. Because go I mean, along, I yeah. feel like I feel like I I have actually selected a few slides which would I thought speak to those works, and then we can further a yeah. conversation uh, as we sort of go along. So, I mean, you are aware of this particular works, the the non-human touch film, but also the series of photographs uh, from my new body of work, Entanglements of Time and Time. And essentially, I have to say that you know this work is fueled by this curiosity to learn uh, and to understand more about what lies beneath sort of our feet, beneath the pal palpable. What are these hidden worlds? Uh, what stories and what enigmas? But also, what nightmares lie beneath our lands, for instance? What are these entanglements of human and other than human lives? And so, through this body of work, I have I ask how political and economic activities have come to uh, shape the centers of our worlds, uh, but also the fibers, the tissues, the forms of our lands and water bodies, and how is the movement of humans and non-humans remade through certain uh, human or anthropogenic activities? And so this film opens out with this panoramic view of like Cremond Island, uh, which is like this remote tidal island in Scotland. And it's, uh, it's one of the estuaries of the Firth of Forth, which then opens up on, into the North Sea. And uh, on the left side, you can see an image where you have uh, a view of, you can see Cremond Island in the far distance. Yes. And you have this path that then joins the uh, mainland to the island. And on the right is the detail of that path. But essentially, you see on the left, it's a low, it's an image taken at low tide, and on the right, you see this image where you have, you know, these these giant sort of uh, pylons that are uh, on one side of the path, and they almost like they're sentinels on the shore, and these were constructed. Uh, this had a, you know, the site had a role to play during World War One, but also a significant role during World War Two. Um, and so these pylons or these concrete structures that you see, quite ugly structures, brutalist, uh, you know, kind of massive, giant concrete pillars, these, these things were sort of built uh, uh, and uh, reinforced during the World War II to stop torpedo boats uh, from coming in, uh, so on and so right. forth. And I think the first thing that struck me, sorry, um, first thing that struck me is the fact that, you know, at high tide, yeah. The water completely takes over and the only thing that you see revealed is the very tops of these pylons. The rest of it is all submerged. Right. And then when you observe these pylons up close, you see that uh, here's the, on the left, you see a detail uh, of the pylon actually. You see that the way that nature has sort of consumed it, you know, it's completely engulfed. And right. these, uh, these creatures are sort of reveling. Um, and uh, so it's a story that changes by day, changes by night as the tide comes in and, and sort of goes. And so as a site itself, it's quite, uh, it's quite a dramatic kind of uh, site. And, you know, it changes with, with uh, you know, the tide, it changes with the light. Uh, and so I was instantly drawn in, you know, to this, uh, to this site. And so uh, what one did is that, uh, you know, we, uh, I was accompanied on this field visit. Uh, and of course, this was followed by several other field visits as we went along with the project. Uh, we, I was accompanied by uh, ASCAS lab technician and soil microbiologist. You're, you're working, so was, you were working with the lab. I was working with the lab as an artist. And yeah. uh, I was, of course, I was free to sort of have my own 
experience of sites, uh, my own encounter. So it was it was at one of these moments where we visited the Cremont Island and it sort of drew me in. And so I decided to sort of see what kind of intervention or investigation or what kind of curiosity I have with it and how it goes forward. And so this is one of the things about my practice is that I've never gone in anywhere with a pre preconceived notion of making a work. And I think for me, this is paid off in so many ways. Uh, because I think as soon as you have a rigid something in mind, and that's where you close all your doors. Uh, and so there are no expectations uh, at all at any point with any of these projects. It's just, just going in with a curiosity and an open mind. And I think that works wonders. Um, and I think that that is something that even to a younger generation of artists, I would like to uh, this is this is this is uh, something that I've learned, and so I would like to extend this this, this information, this knowledge. Artists, so, yeah. yeah, but even there's a younger generation now, no Ravi. But uh, you know, I would like to. This is something that I've learned through my projects, right? Can I, and may so I if ask, you have, uh, yeah, sure. may I ask you a question at this stage, and I don't want to yeah, interrupt sure. about it. What yeah. what drew you and draws you to working with the science lab as an artist? What yeah. is an impulse? Because earlier, earlier work on, yeah. I think on, uh, also you've done work on salt, I think, uh, which you've done in a coach residence. I've done a work on salt. I have salt, some images yes. from that work and, as well. Uh, so, that was called the salt lab. And that was also with, with two, yeah. three labs. So this but also with MSSRF, you know, with the right. mangroves. That's right. With the research institute there in Chennai, right? Yes, yeah. correct. What, what, is, what draws you to this uh, working with scientists or people with other other forms of researching to research. Okay, uh, this goes back to an interest in biology uh, from my childhood days. And because we had certain limitations, you know, uh, in selecting certain courses uh, during my time as well, and that has thankfully changed now uh, over the years, I was not able to take this subject up along with say a history or a psychology or a sociology. It was not one of those acceptable combinations. That option wasn't available to me, you know, in, in my academic time uh, in school. And so this always stayed with me. And the second thing that now when I think back about it is that there's a certain kind of discipline in a science laboratory. And I'm extremely drawn to that kind of discipline, but also the, the actual, um, the, the idea of the labor as well. You know, when you work with all of this material and you're so involved with every little minute detail. And this I I, I've learned from uh, Anupam Sood's etching, uh, you know, from my exercises and, and, and my, my um, you know, my study period with Anupam Sood in, in her studio, which she called the lab, because literally everything functioned uh, in a certain way and in order in her laboratory. It was the science laboratory. It was never the science. It was, it was the etching laboratory and not the etching studio. So what does the artist add to the lab with the yeah. lab that cannot do itself? Yeah. So we will, we will get to that very, okay. very soon sure. uh, as we sort of go along. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like inherently artists and science scientists are looking for the same thing. It's just that the directions with the, which they take and their approaches are very different. And so I feel when both of these disciplines can come, when they come together, uh, it, can, it can be really quite fantastic because it, it then provides an opening to so much more. And so this has been one of the reasons why I have been trying to explore this further and further. But going ahead from this a little bit more, as I continue to research and work with all these laboratories, I'm slowly also very concerned with the ethical and political dimensions of scientific research. And we'll come to that okay. uh, slowly. Uh, but these are the kind of questions that I suppose a, a creative practitioner would uh, go ahead and ask. Right. Uh, rather than a scientist who's very, sometimes very, very preoccupied with all this data. Right. And just working more intentionally to, to sort of produce the data on a regular basis. Right. Um, and so, uh, so what we did was to collect these samples, uh, environmental samples, so essentially soil, um, sand, mud, uh, so on and so forth, water samples and water samples from various sites uh, within this area. And uh, we worked with microbiology, but also microscopy. And this was a very interesting uh, time for me because this was the very first time that I was actually able to do some hands-on work. 
And so unlike, uh, you know, like I said, every residency is different and every opportunity is a learning experience. And uh, for me, this was very, very important. It was a turning point for me because unlike what had happened before in MSSRF, in the laboratory in Chennai, where I was more like somebody who was observing and documenting and in conversation with the scientists. Here I was actually physically involved and engaged with the material. So I was actually working with the material. And so that was the vital difference. And of course, I was given hands-on training uh, in both of these disciplines uh, over a couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, so this was really a valuable experience. Now, moving on to the content of this and what I really, what we started to find. So you have, you have a site uh, and it's an inha inhabitable site, essentially. And so you presume that, you know, we know that there's to some extent that has been uh, anthropogenic activity in the past in terms of, you know, it was associated with the war, et cetera, et cetera. But then what happened is that as we started culturing the microbes, we started to find huge amounts of E. coli bacteria coming up in our samples. And this was just by chance. And I, I kept wondering, like we, we know that E. coli is associated with human gut, uh, you know, like uh, an animal, it, it, it stays in the gut and uh, it, can, it can potentially also be disease causing and so on and so forth or, or disturbing uh, in a certain way. But uh, the question for me was that, you know, how is it possible that this land, which is essentially now uninhabited can have such huge amounts of this particular kind of potentially dangerous bacteria. And that's when I started to look up and, and dig into the history of this place. A, couple, a decade, uh, you know, I started following through and I started speaking to scientists and other, because, because this was also a collaboration with Marine Scotland, I was in contact with some of the chief scientists as well. And so, because they were so familiar with the water and the land in these areas, and they were constantly looking at conserving certain ecosystems. And so I had access to this information and started to dig things up. And so then I find... Yes, uh, if you were upon... in the last slide, you had a title yeah. which I'm really interested in. Back. Uh, it said, yeah. what does it mean? What does it mean to be at risk at each other? Yeah, so, so we are coming, we are slowly about, coming to that. To that. We, will talk, we will talk more about that, yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah. So um, I started to look, uh, so dig up information, and then I found all of these articles, research papers, but also like um, reports in, in popular um, magazines and newspapers, where it said that the boundaries of Edinburgh enclose some 15 kilometers of coastline. And to some degree, all of this is polluted by domestic and industrial waste discharge untreated, mostly below water. Uh, the, below the watermark. And so it was observable that both the flora and fauna were noticeably poor in, in species by the scientists and by their studies than those of unpolluted shores elsewhere in the further fork. Similarly, a study conducted in 1998, which then tell us, tells us, and, and, and you know, you will, you've probably seen excerpts of this in the film as well, uh, that in 1994, they, they again, they found the sewage-related debris, which they then decided to term as other. It came into the others, the category of others, whereas plastic and other pollution, metal pollution and others were a separate category um, altogether. And then again, reports which said that the water does not meet the quality standards, meaning that shellfish contaminated with harmful bacteria could have been could have found its ways to people's plates. There were also reports of illegal harvesting of shellfish from this Cremond area, and so, uh, for instance, up to a hundred kilos of hundred kilos—that's a lot of contaminated shellfish destined for Lothian restaurants—has been seized by police near Cremond Beach, for instance. And so, um, you know, it starts another investigation where I start. Um, making with the scientists these elaborate columns uh, built with mud, sand, soil, uh, which have been collected from this particular habitat. And we start to cult culture and observe uh, these microbes. And so these are self-sustaining ecosystems. That's actually a glass jar that you're looking at. It's a cylindrical glass jar. And uh, so we started to um, culture these microbes, both, of course, in the Petri dish that you saw earlier, but also in these jars where you could actually see them uh, changing uh, through these layers and through these colors. And so we're observing the, the species of bacteria through the colors and through the changes over, right. over weeks, months, but also over years, because this, this work is still ongoing. 
and some of these objects are on display at my solo right now at Edinburgh Printmakers. And these, you know, these jars are there. Yeah, you will find these jars that these objects are there on display, and of course they're living objects, so they are changing, evolving, uh, growing, so on and so forth. And so um, for me, it through this project, it was a hope that cross-disciplinary collaboration can help us explore new ways of sensing, caring, noticing, and experiencing the world around us. And essentially, uh, you know, let's, let's look at bacteria, you know, like the history of bacteria is also practically since the 19th century, uh, history of infectious diseases as well, uh, which is more associated, has always been more associated than talking about bacteria in, you know, the role of bacteria in the health of living organisms, for instance. And there come in, you know, the influence of scientists such as Professor Margaret McFall Nye in my work, for instance, who, who inculcated the idea of looking at ecosystems, um, you know, or, or also our own human ecosystem, our body as a nested ecosystem. And so the idea that within a body, we have more microbial cells than human cells. And so talking about my own body and my own experience from which this whole work evolves, the idea that even during my pe pregnancy, this, this came, this, these kind of thoughts came up during my pregnancy. The thought that, you know, when, a, uh, when you get pregnant or when I was pregnant and the fetus comes into the body, it is seen as the, by the body as a foreign object. Your own child, you know, after, your con after it is conceived, is seen by your body as a foreign object. Whereas the microbes are actually an integral part of your, the, of your ecosystem. The microbiome, you know, the gut bacteria, for instance. And so important elements today that we need to see the role, uh, the beneficial role of the bacteria. People today are talking about immunity. Immunity has become like the key word in today's time. And so bacteria... Of course, these organisms are, are, have the biggest role to play uh, when it comes to that. And so, you know, how does one create awareness about, about such, you know, very, very minute creatures, but also of, about things, Ravi, that cannot be seen with the naked eye? Right. How do you, as an artist, connect an audience to something that they cannot see? And these were some of the largest, larger questions. Uh, in, in the work. But then again, talking about the ethical angle of working with, with in the area of bio art, for instance, you know, there are certain vulnerabilities that I, I was confronted with as I sort of made these, uh, these, this body of work, you know, as these objects were sort of ready, photographed, documented, they're still living, they're still dry, uh, they're still thriving, they're evolving. But certain kind of ethical questions started to pop up in my head. And so, um, I allowed for this experience to this work to sort of evolve by itself. And so this film, The Non-Human Touch, is very much something that has happened organically. The film has literally progressed organically. So it can be viewed in various ways, a travelogue, uh, a personal diary, a lab notebook. But it, it also shows an artist's vulnerability and questions and queries when, uh, when the artist is working in this environment and with these uh, these materials and so it lays bare these vulnerabilities and I wanted people to know about these queries because it's not like we always have the answers. Sometimes when I'm, I'm researching and I'm working even with, with the salt lab project when I'm looking at transgenic plants, I'm, I often have many more queries than answers and really for me, you know, having those queries is a way of opening up my understanding of the world and the world that we live in, for instance. Yeah. And so I'll share with you some of the queries that comes up, uh, you know, with such a practice. And as I sort of move along with working with such organisms, um, for instance, what constitutes life? Who gets to determine what lives are created and grown? Which are saved, exploited or destroyed? What do we think about living material such as life tissues, bacteria, living organisms and life processes as a medium? What does it mean to have agency and ownership, for instance, over another's life? Do we think of this lively material as a carrier, holder, vessel, receptacle, or repository that is then populated by our own thoughts and ideas? What is the human role of human beings as makers? 
and going forward with this work ultimately we know that this has to be uh, destroyed with a certain protocol in the laboratory this work right and so what do we think about the notion of disposal and in this case of these particular lively objects that will soon become infectious laboratory waste and therefore what does it mean to be at risk with each other right what do we think of contamination and uh, and so again in a laboratory when does contamination become collaboration i think these are the key key questions that come have come out of this work for me um yeah and so uh, again another part of another uh, series of work created again within the the whole uh, umbrella series entanglements of time and tide and now what you see is these uh, these images and these are large images um, this body of work is called drifters and wanderers and this is an exploration of again uh, the really tiny critters uh, the planktonic ecosystem the planktonic world of the north sea and atlantic ocean and so there was a lot of again the collaboration here is with marine scotland and so they you know, they were able to get me live samples from the north sea so to sort of view uh, and document for my project and this was a very important time because uh, for the first time i think in 10 years and of course we know that whenever um, you know an organization or an institution uh, comes up with a, a marine an, an assessment report this is something that has to be collated or uh, drafted together with a with a whole lot of data and this data uh, you know is is you know 10 years it has to be over 10 years or longer periods 15 years and so this was a very important time at the marine scotland laboratory in aberdeen where i was also resident for a while um, as a part of this whole project and so they were collating this report which is now out it's accessible to everybody that for the first time it was revealed that the the north sea atlantic ocean planktonic community is under massive threat for various reasons yeah and so the idea was to draw attention on these but also talk about the idea of uh, unlikely beauty because that's where you know we have this entanglement with our with our culture and our preconceived notions uh, again of, of what of aesthetics of beauty and all these conversations are sort of drawn open with this body of work because while some people would look at these images and say wow you know uh, and and when i tell them that you know in a, gla a glass of uh, sea water you would find millions of these creatures possibly potentially right and so sometimes you would see a sense of wonder Uh, in somebody's eyes but equally you would see a sense of horror because then the next question to me would be something like oh my god please don't tell me this this is indeed horrifying to know that these monsters exist amongst us this is uh, it's through a microscope these are all through um, a microscope and with relatively high magnifications um so um for instance this is an image of a decapod megalopa and that's a larval stage of a crab or a crustacean community so to say and so the sample that i would get so when you view the sample in a in in a dish or a jar the first instance one views the entire uh, specimen that or the sample that you have received and so it looks like something on the right and then what one one was doing was to isolate a single little critter and then view that in greater detail so you see a zoe larva a larval crab on the left side and so it's really interesting that these critters are so important to the marine food web so while you have diatoms uh, on the base of the food chain and diatoms of course they're photosynthetic creatures they're, they're responsible for most of the oxygen that you find in the planet uh, and they have so many other vital functions zooplankton are uh, a part of the plankton planktonic community they are the animal component of the planktonic community these little critters and so they are on the second trophic level uh, you know of this ecosystem and so they consume of, of diatoms for instance or or phytoplanktons as we refer to the whole community and then these are in turn you know sort of consumed by fish um, and then this kind of food chain sort of move upwards and upwards and finally of course you have the larger mammals 
uh, such as your uh, dolphins and the whale and the seal, for instance, uh, higher up in the trophic levels. Yeah. In the earlier one, is it, do you feel it's your, uh, the artist's job to reveal this to the world? I think most definitely. I think because awareness, I think is a key word forward. Creating an awareness. But it's just that, it's just the idea of, but also awareness amongst not just our communities, Ravi, um, awareness amongst the public. And so I think this is where multidisciplinary collaborations become so important. It becomes important to open doors and invite more and more people into your conversations. And so I feel that, you know, more often than not, and this is a dilemma that I have, you know, it's, uh, it's becoming something that's uh, quite evident, you know, in the last uh, couple of years. And, and then if I look at a typical sort of galleries, white cube gallery scenario, I just have to wonder that, you know, like how, how is an artist only, if an artist is only working within that space of that white cube, how do you generate this kind of interest in community, in sort of public participation, so on and so forth. And so then collaboration becomes a very important word. But also working with institutions and other kind of institutions, various kinds of institutions uh, will bring in those people. And so and how does an allow artist, for this conversation, you know, to sort how of move does artists uh, rethink the scientific agenda? How does the artist help this idea of uh, thinking outside the categories, isolated categories, yeah. that science is very uh, uh, conditioned in its own? It's very yeah. influencing the science to think the the linear stable or the, or the absolutely you know absolutely. the uh, the yeah. metal stable. So this classification categorization yeah. is very much part of organizing thoughts and ideas in science yeah so i think this how do you bring points... entanglement into it how do you bring the other stories which science does not acknowledge exactly so i think there is uh, there are a couple of points within these points that you have raised and for one thing is that one for one thing uh, working within this discipline already one already acknowledges the controversies with sort of a historical science research, historical science practice. And again, I'm talking about, you know, colonialisms or extractivisms. Uh, and uh, even if you look at botanical gardens, so on and so forth, you know, the, the whole the whole practice of it, so as to say, uh, exploitation, uh, so and so on and so forth. But I think for me, my personal practice is engaged with a creation of this knowledge which extends to not only scientific, Western scientific knowledge, but also incorporating other knowledge systems into it. Right. So, you know, the views of communities, uh, for instance, always have played a very important role in this. So uh, I believe, at least from my uh, perspective, that it is important today to understand and to sort of bring together all these knowledges, not just the voice of one knowledge. And so for me, it's a position where I'm working often from within a scientific institution, but it's not like I'm not challenging uh, some of what they're doing already. And so it is that space. It's a sort of gray area within which I work. And so I feel like an artist position then becomes a very important one, uh, you know, within, a, within this scenario. Uh, not only as a communicator of science, but also somebody who works in the cultural domain and so then brings these very important questions also in front of the scientists themselves and their own practice as well. And I'm hoping that I would be able to do a lot more of this. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a kind of a, it's a kind of a thing where one has decided to dedicate a lifetime of work and see, you know, what one is able to achieve and how far one can push oneself every and time. What you know, kind of collaborations will an artist have to make? Other collaborations, you think, to achieve yeah. that? How does the artist relocate oneself from, as you said, the white gallery space to, of course, what you're doing with the laboratory, scientific laboratory, but also, as we just said about, or bring other knowledge systems there, you know, which yeah. have a totally different way of looking. So how do you relocate the artist in this scenario? Yeah, so um, because outside you know, the gallery space, the artist loses the exclusivity of being an artist, and the artist I becomes part of what, the community of society or of 
the human and the non-human? How does the artist relocate oneself? I think we have to play multiple roles. Mm. We are all already doing that. Mm. But I think that is one area where, uh, you know, I think we need to look at very carefully uh, in order to expand this field further. Mm. I think this field needs to expand for so many reasons. And today's critical times calls upon us uh, in, as a way of also a sense of responsibility mm. that should be felt. Because we are not only artists within an artist community, uh, artist community, but we are also active citizens, and we are also people living within communities of, within a society and within a community. And so it is, in a way, it is already in one way. I mean, this is the way that I look at it: that it is already a part of our responsibility to sort of get these groups of people together. And exactly how is something that perhaps I'm still something that I'm I'm yeah, dealing with. I'm still but exploring, think it's important. but I think it's extremely important yeah. uh, to expand one's practice and be open-minded. And you also once you'd mentioned uh, about challenging the, the politics of scientific institutions. Yes, I think that's a absolutely. Word yes, how, absolutely. How did you do that? And how do you, what, what is that? I, what does that mean? Right. Okay. So um, I think we we'll move on to this body yeah. of work. Sure, please. And uh, this was a really um, important work, I would say, uh, that I have done for so many reasons, uh, and mostly also for myself, mm. in terms of everything that I've learned with this project over a couple of years. And it's somehow the nature of my project that, you know, uh, nature of my work that it just goes on for a really long period of time. And so each of these engagements with projects are almost always still ongoing because I like to revisit the sites. And for me, uh, working with collaborators is also very importantly about building friendships with people. And that is extremely important. And so I, I maintain those, uh, those friendships. Um, and so this is also how it's become sort of a learning experience for me over a, over a period of time. And I constantly revisit, uh, I try to revisit those locations. Uh, laboratories, uh, you know, uh, and be in touch with my friends, collaborators over a period of time. So this, this project was very interesting. This project was supported again, very generously by coach, but also by Welcome Trust um, UK, DBT India Alliance back in 2000, between 2000, from 2017 to 2019. And then of course, I'm, I'm continuing work uh, on, on this on my own as well now. But essentially, it was a look into a salinity as one of the major uh, issues that uh, our crops are, uh, you know, with the crops, uh, for instance, with the focus on rice as well. But again, related to, interestingly, very related to the project that I did on the mangroves. Um, because, uh, you know, as I would travel in those ecosystems and travel around in that area, of course, you had the sea, uh, then you have the mangrove belt or the halophytic sort of belt, and then you have the paddy fields and so on and so forth. And so there's a direct, again, uh, interconnection between these ecosystems and also the flow of people in and out of these ecosystems. So there are these already existing entanglements uh, there. And so I was very keen to understand uh, the context of, uh, you know, understand uh, this within the context of salinity, and that was the focus of the project. And essentially what I did was to look at um, indigenous rice uh, crops. In, in, uh, so I was looking at nearly 20 to 25 indigenous varieties of um, rice, which were from coastal areas in particular, because that was the focus of the project. And I was also looking at transgenic rice simultaneously, um, which was a study that was being done at the time and still ongoing at the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation. Uh, and this particular rice is now being sort of crossed over with uh, mangrove genes as an attempt to achieve some kind of drought tolerance, but also uh, drought resistance and salt tolerance in a future scenario uh, of, uh, you know, ex extreme events. Of course, they are a part of our, uh, our life story today, but also but in, in the case of extinctions, but also looking at uh, extreme scenarios of uh, hunger and food insecurity in coastal areas. So in it, at MSSRF, they, they looked at this as, uh, they called it the, um, I have this noted somewhere, anticipatory research in the yeah. scenario of uh, climate change. 
And so this project, what this does is that, so I had interviews and I had conversation with a range of um, scientists, uh, ecologists, biologists, uh, conservators, so on and so forth, uh, to try to understand their positions uh, also in their own personal practices, but also uh, what their own contributions within this whole dialogue of transgenics. And uh, what you see here, I mean, Ravi, I don't know, have you, did you have a chance of seeing I this saw, work already? I saw it in quotes. Okay, so you, you also, you see that, I mean, here it's not very clear, but there is text also accompanying yeah. each of you these don't have charts. Any, do you have any larger I images? do have, I do have this, for yeah. instance. Yeah. And so, tell us about this. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> this particular image is uh, a tobacco. So now, going back again uh, in an almost relatable yet unrelatable way, but of course you'll understand why I'm doing that. Is that the image of the mouse yeah. that you had, yeah, right? Yeah. And this particular image, you talked about the mouse as a sort of or a rat as a guinea pig for experiments. Yeah. And so while I was at the laboratory, yeah. I noticed, and of course, this is again, it's a common factor in science research, that the tobacco is one such plant. Yeah. So what you see here in these jars is transgenic tobaccos, yeah. which has within its system genes from Avicenia marina, which is a mangrove plant. Yeah. In the study for salt tolerance in rice. Okay. And so this is really interesting. Because it throws open so many questions about yeah. plants, about plants' right, about senti yeah. sentience, right? Yeah. What we conceive as, right, as, as life, but also what is what for us, which life is important and which isn't. And so in any typical kind of laboratory that is doing this experiment, you see on a weekly basis, you see tons and tons of this biomass literally being thrown away. Because then as, as the researcher sort of move, moves ahead uh, with his or her practice, for instance. So this is, this is something that I actually call the rat plant. It is pre it's pretty much the same thing. Yeah. And so these kind of questions started to come up in this, in this practice of mine. But also, um, if I can talk a little bit more in detail about this, yeah. then I'd like to tell you about what some of these observations were. And they were from diverse people, so people had different uh, different stances. And I'm and I would like to add at this point that Dr. Swaminathan himself, in my conversation with him, and this was over a period of time, the well-known economist, of and course, uh, Dr. Yeah. Professor Swaminathan himself, in one of our, our conversations together, he himself was talking about how we have to be cautious about trans transgenics especially when they are out in the open field because of certain aspects related to homogeneity uh, in, in crops and homogeneity is not uh, a great thing. And this is, this is spoken by him to me directly. So essentially, but then understanding also that this kind of research is very, perhaps very important because if you're looking at food safety, food security and saving lives, you know, in, you know, you know, in future scenarios. So then he also stressed simultaneously about why this kind of research was important, but how we must move ahead with extreme caution. And so this also reminds me once again, goes back to this conversation about the green revolution, right? Where uh, the, the intention about this whole idea of the intention of the scientists and then again, the politics of a certain period. And for instance, even if you look at a state like Punjab and the land, which is actually historically not known for cultivating certain crops, uh, but now increasingly with the green revolution and with the seeds coming in, so on and so forth, has now, is now churning out these crops, uh, crops. and at what extent, you know, to what extent and, at, and what's at risk, really. So these are the kind of conversations that come up through this work. And so we have, we have um, you know, comments such as genetic variability becomes very limited if you take genetic modification, because with one or two varieties, you cover large areas. BT cotton, for example, covers large areas, and that is always dangerous. Genetic homogeneity increases genetic vulnerability, diseases, and pests. Therefore, you have to be careful. And then 
coming from Dr. Anurag Kurpur. As I understand, Indian law forbids the patenting of seeds without violating violating the trips. But I also understand this, that specific man-made gene segments can be patented. If that segment is in a seed, then is the seed in effect patentable? And further, I think there are bigger economic and social problems to consider when one thinks about ownership of seeds. Right. And furthering the conversation. Fragility re resulting from adverse environmental conditions linked to climate change fundamentally alters the linkages between agriculture and nutrition outcomes. So when margins are slender, vulnerability to adverse climate is magnified. Sometimes this is a chronic and steadily worsening process that encourage migration, encourages migration and therefore these entanglements with its own consequences or even worse consequences with catastrophic climate events. And so food shocks are an integral part of this. And so food shocks and the whole, and migration become an important part of this, the larger uh, conversation around this body of work and uh, so on and so forth. So right. uh, the idea was pretty much for me to, you know, you, these kind of laboratories are not accessible to people, but and the idea was that an art space is, Right, and so what I wanted very much was for people to come into this space, and you have these diverse. It is it is built from an understanding that people are intelligent, that you know there are that I always have this thing of not, of of working with prompts and ideas, right? And so I then I want people to make their own experiential journey through these conversations, and sort of so they they dig up so many so many issues you know there's so many interrelated issues that sort of come up and i want people to sort of have their own judgments have their own but have informed judgments and sort of have their own opinions and so this space which is the project space becomes like a discursive arena and i feel like sometimes so for instance in at coach what happened was that there were so many people from different backgrounds uh, uh you know coming in for this project when it was uh, on view uh, from you know uh, economics to science to engineering to you know uh, school children who did these tours and things like that and so this was a this was such a welcome uh, a welcome change you know because there were conversations that were coming up there were questions there were answers and so having this a sort of a positive impactful dialogue rather than just stating what is right and what is wrong I think this is very important. And so this has been important in my practice as well, where the, the audience is allowed to have that, that time to sort of go through the work, make their own inquiries, come up with their own questions, have their own answers, their own stance. And so I welcome this dialogue and this conversation. So what has been your experience with, uh, because you've obviously taken upon, it's like almost like a mission to, to be an artist who, uh, helps unearth the complex entanglements of of the natural world and also the natural world as it's being shaped by the, the by you by humans and by science and I think that is uh, and how do you so what has been your experience so far uh, is you think the art space is a productive space for you or do you think that you would uh, uh, that the art space limits you in terms of what you're expected to do there. And what does what does then become the relationship between you as an artist uh, and one of the one one of the uh, concerns of an artist is is about aesthetics. So what has been your navigation through the idea of, uh, you know, creating an aesthetics of knowledge, so to say? So that's a very, very interesting question. And I think the answer is uh, a little bit of all of these things that you know you have sort of brought forth. But I do believe, uh, and I've always believed that the arts is a very productive, um, of course, it's a creative space, but it's an incredibly productive space for me because you know it's given me the tools to work with. And I think one has to always and always remember that. Um, and, and so it is because I have these tools, I have a background in it, not that it's necessarily important, but for me, it's, be, it's been important because of the way that I have brought in all, 
and worked with diverse, with collaboration, but also with multiple material. And that material range, you know, that speaks to people, this ranges all the way from video to installation, to photography, to painting, to drawing. And so art has given me that space to work, work from. And so I have a position as an artist reaching out to people. And I think for me, that space uh, is extremely important. But also going forward, I think uh, there are also, uh, I think there's, there's a word that comes up and uh, a lot of my contemporaries, and I'm going to say this honestly, a lot of my contemporaries will shy away from using the word activist. And I'm extremely concerned about this because because for the simple reason is that I feel like in today's time, we need to expand our definition of the word activist. And so I'm equally concerned with the idea of how an artist's personal practice can be a form of activism. And so I would like to also throw these kind of questions open to my peers and my colleagues uh, who work within whose a lot of works have, uh, you know, these political ecological undertones, but they they're constantly afraid to use this word. For what reason? I just don't understand. What is their you mind think, shying away from you this You think term? because it, you, they feel that art becomes a tool for activism rather than create a whole, it, uh, be uh, something Why? which uh, in its own language. And uh, it becomes uh, 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 used for, in an idea. So how does the idea of the ideas you're talking about, how do... How do you create an aesthetics which is grounded in ideas, but not a tool to these ideas? So when I'm working, Ravi, and depending, again, it depends on the project also and the space, for instance, you know, again, um, because we do, we do still, ha we do have to keep these things in mind as well. So for instance, the project at Edinburgh Printmakers, right? Um, you know, I work with, I work with institution, I work with people, I work with collaborations, and I'm open to using material. And that has helped me a lot because, for instance, printmaking, in the case of this particular show, you know, printmaking as a material, there's a certain way, a certain aesthetic that it would allow uh, as well. Uh, and so I have worked with these things as well. And so even, even if you look at these, these images, you know, of the, of the plankton community and things like that, right, the image speaks for itself. It is, it, is an, it is an image that is sort of, I would say that the form, the minuscule form becomes then larger than life. It becomes something to look at. Uh, it's, it's awe-inspiring in many ways. It connects to the audience and by magnifying and using these, this kind of change of scale. I think this is, these are some of the, the tools and the methods with which, which I like to navigate this aesthetic space as well. And so I feel that the visual language often is also, also important in my work. And I, there's no denying that for me at all. The visual narrative is also very important in order to give a message. And so it sort of ties in, into the practice. Do you see aesthetics as a language of the artist? Uh, for sure. Mm. Most definitely. So um, I think um, this is really fascinating to see you navigate these many spheres of both uh, political ideas, but also uh, navigating it through practice, you know, that is the most complex part of you have to create new, new, new sense of what the artist's role is. And the artist's role is always defined by the artist's language. You know, the artist has a language, which is not the language of science, which is not the language of uh, literature, but it is own, a visual artist has, has his, uh, her own language. So I think that is a complex and learning, constantly learning process. There's no easy easy answer to what that will turn out to be. There's no easy answer. And also the, you know, when you collaborate and you work with people or you hope to work with people, there are so many challenges there as well. And often there are these huge accompanied with this is also huge disappointments. And so you have to, uh, you know, you have to, there's a system, you know, that you work with and you, you understand that, you know, there are uh, these conditions under which you have to work and you have to continue working. And so, being open is one way to do it, but also to understand that it's not an easy path uh, yeah. and knowing that already uh, and accepting that also as a challenge. I think that is a way forward. I and you think. started with the word with empathy. When you talk of yeah. empathy is the most important thing. When you talk of your own children as well. 
And I think underlying all the whole practice, all these, your practices, similar practices, uh, are the ethics of something. Ethics is underlying it. It's not from where you enter the space. It's an ethical space you want to open out. So that itself is a political and ethical position through which you enter a certain, certain question. And so how do you, so just as a final question, and unless you want to say something else, how do you see in the future, you think the artist's role will be redefined, especially with this large fundamental question such as the multi-species world? Does the artist help create a different way in which we understand the world and help shape it? And do you see that artists produce new collaborations? because the artist cannot work alone. We are all informed by so many other ideas. The word entanglement also comes from so many other scholars in a sense. Exactly. So how do, you, how do you see the future of your work and the artist's work in this endeavor? So interestingly, um, I think that going forward, I think a younger generation of artists is, I think, more conscious uh, about so many things. It's also driven by the kind of world uh, and uh, that we live in today but also this kind of impulse is also driven by the urgency of the contemporary moment right and so i feel that going forward uh, there are already vis visible changes within the arts i can see it more outside uh, you know maybe our country some of the practices that you find here more, i can see it more with younger artists and artists of my own generation outside and, um, but I'm hoping that this is slowly changing. Uh, and this is, is because uh, certain questions are, have become very, very important. And so, yes, an artist's role will have to change going forward. It is the need of the moment, I feel. But there are also coming from such a place as, as ours, our country, for instance, we are also limited by so many other factors. And so it is also, it's a very complex question and it's a very complex situation to understand because of a certain societal condition, certain, certain economic backgrounds from where, you know, our, our artists, the young students are also coming from and a certain kind of, let's just say a certain language that is being already promoted by a handful of galleries and I'm being very open here, Ravi, certain galleries, uh, certain, you know, collectors or curators. And so what happens in that case is that it's very easy to fall into a certain kind of format working. And that again has its own repercussions going forward and it can be limiting in so many ways. So many things have to change. A thinking process has to change. And, you know, so yeah, you know, there's no, there's no, you know, you're, you know this yourself that there is no, no very easy way of talking about this for so many reasons, right? Yeah. There's so many layers and so many complications uh, here. But I think, I, I think moving forward a lot absolutely will have to change. Uh, if, if, if artists are to live in this world uh, and we have to be more responsive and more responsible towards what's happening, we cannot be blinded by you know, just our own limited studio uh, uh, activity and staying within closed doors, even if that is their only way to re respond to something. I mean, there has to be something more, you know, there, there should be something more. Um, right. And so, uh, yeah, so there are, there are many more questions than answers, yeah. Ravi, but and, and of uh, course, do you believe also that yeah, this is, this is, be there'll be many more conversations we'll have. And as we go along, uh, it, it, over time, we'll follow this question up because I do believe many things have to change uh, fundamentally and the artist has to relocate oneself as what or who uh, she thinks or he thinks as, of oneself and acknowledges the world one is in. So I, I always believe that. But this is an ongoing struggle, if you want to use the word, and I think we will... Fall to fall, go ahead, fall to fall, go ahead, and continue with that. So, but I wish you all the best for your work. Thank and you, I look Ravi. Forward, all the best to your next show. And Thank I look you forward so to, to seeing it and uh, maybe not in person because in Berlin, but to see images of it and then to seeing some of your work here later on as we are working together on that too. So, okay, thank you very much for sparing so much time and uh, taking so much time to explain 
uh, your practice and your uh, your pursuits it's all, it's always a pleasure ravi and also one uh, you know during my own you know last decade of practice i have also been very inspired by artists such as yourself uh, and so it is always a pleasure to talk to you and to discuss thoughts and ideas yeah and no artist lives in isolation so i think i'm inspired by you too so it's always a, use the word again entanglement and creativity is also entangled with everybody else's creativity yes. wonderful yeah. thanks thanks sonia have a good day thanks thank thanks you ravi